<laughs> it's early, folks, and I really do appreciate that you've come out. The first thing we're going to do, because it's early, is a bit of guided meditation. <laughs> so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine that instead of coming to the Golden Age Cinema this morning, when you woke up, you woke up in a darkened room. You have no memory of how you got there. You have no knowledge of even where you are. There's, there's nothing to see there. Nothing to see. And then eventually, and you can open your eyes now, eventually, somewhere out there in the room, you see a glowing pane of light. And you feel your way toward it. And as you feel your way toward it, you, you, you can feel your fact. Someone's put a chair in front of this glowing pane of light, and you sit down on the chair. There's nothing else to look at. So basically, all you do is you're staring into this glowing pane of light. Slowly, an image resolves. It fades out of the light. That image is someone you love. And as that image resolves, you feel the warmth of that love, and it is flooding through you. It removes some of the sting of you being alone in this dark and not knowing where you are and why. And you relax, and you smile a bit. Now, unbeknownst to you, this room is actually far from empty. It is studded with sensors of every description. There are eyes, and there are ears, and there are motion detectors. You are squarely in their sights. That smile is noted. That relaxed posture, that widening of the pupils. It's all recorded. It's all remembered. That image fades. It's replaced by another one. Now this one, this one means nothing to you. You squint, you sort of look at it, try to make sense of it, just kind of shake your head. That's recorded. That's remembered. That image too fades away. And after what seems like maybe too long a moment of anticipation, another image appears. This one is sad. This this is cruel. This is hateful. How could someone do that? How could someone be so ugly and so thoughtless? You look away. It's too much to bear. Your fists clench. Your breathing tightens. And when at last that image fades away, you feel only relief. It's all recorded. It's all remembered. And across what seems like Endless hours, the images appear, you respond. It's all recorded. It's all remembered. And then, at last, the screen goes dark, and you pass into an exhausted sleep. And you wake again, and the screen is there glowing. You rush to stare into it. An image appears, you smile. And then, much more quickly than before, it's replaced by another image. And you smile again. And these images, this endless series of scenes, each just different enough from the one that came before, yet familiar enough, each in their own way, each comforting, each happy, each leaving you with an overall sense of warmth. The screen fades. When you look away from it, the feeling fades. You look back, the screen brightens. But why would you ever look away from that screen? Isn't it so much better to look into that screen and feel good? Six years ago, 2011, Facebook had reached its limits to growth. Not in the raw number of users, that was continuing to grow. It reached its limits to growth on how long every day each user spent on the site. And because Facebook generates its revenue 
from advertising, its fortunes rise and fall based on the number of ads each user sees, which is a number that is directly connected to how long each user spends every day on Facebook. And at that point, Facebook made a critical decision, curation. Curation sounds desirable. It sounds better than another word that could be used in its place, censorship. The censorship was driven by another technology, a deep data gathering. And that data gathering proved the basis for an incredibly enhanced profile of the user. Everything a user on Facebook does is noted and added to that profile. For Facebook, that profile is the user. And an analysis of that profile tells Facebook everything they need to know to censor a user's newsfeed. That censorship hides the things users don't like. That censorship highlights the things users do like. That censorship presents a view of the world that is designed to increase user engagement. It's designed to keep people on Facebook more of the time. It's designed to increase user exposure to advertising. It's designed to increase Facebook's revenues, and of course, that worked. <coughs> but it left something in its wake. It left something unexpected, because in order to optimize its capacity, in order to optimize its capacity to censor user news feeds, Facebook coupled its profiling with machine learning. Machine learning is, at essence, the capacity to be able to learn from your mistakes. Facebook censors a user's profile, carefully watches how the engagement changes, and feeds those observations back into the user's profile. So that profile is both observational and experimental. And that process of coupling machine learning and profiling has dramatically increased the effectiveness of that censorship. Engagement for Facebook is an algorithmic outcome. It's a sign that the system is learning. And therein is the problem. All learning systems are designed with goals. They learn as a means toward an end, and that end can change. In the solution to their user engagement problem, Facebook had possibly inadvertently done something else. They'd done something far more powerful. And that first came to light in a few papers that were published back in 2015 when it was revealed that Facebook had demonstrated the capacity to alter the moods of its users by changing what they censored into their news feeds. And when that all came out, Facebook apologized, said it was simply a science experiment. It would not be repeated. But their hand had been tipped. And at the beginning of May this year, when The Australian reported that Facebook's Australian leadership team had shopped around a deck to the banks showing that emotionally vulnerable teens could be detected and targeted for advertising when at their most vulnerable, well, that was when the full extent of this machinery came into clear view. I call it the weaponization of influence. And it opens the doors to the last days of reality. Facebook represents a single component in a broader shift to a hypermediated world where everything we know about the world is passing through layer after layer of machinery that is more and more hidden from view. All of this machinery is always censoring our knowledge of the world, including our knowledge of that machinery. 
Now, before these machines can finish their work and completely disappear from view, we have an opportunity to identify and to catalog all of the processes that are shaping our ability to know about what is real. Any catalog has to include at least four items. One of them is the monetization of propaganda in fake news. The second is the use of machine learning to develop user profiles that accurately measure and model emotional states. The third is the rise of neuromarketing, which is highly tailored messages that nudge us to act in ways that might not be in our own best interests. And the fourth is a new technology called augmented reality, which will finally basically sever all of the links with our senses. These four technologies are coming together right now. They're a nexus of technology and capital. Each is amplifying the other almost beyond imagining. They're warping the fabric of what we think is real, and they offer attractions so alluring to us that many people are going to find it very difficult to resist. They are framing a newly emerging world that can only be named as post real. So in the last days of reality, technological, technological progress has engulfed all of our ways of knowing. It accelerates into an epistemological crisis where the real world is disappearing forever. OK, fake news, fake news. We know fake news exists. We know that Facebook amplifies the reach of fake news. We know that fake, uh, Facebook monetizes fake news because fake news is simply the news that users want to believe and therefore will end up in their feed because that's the way the profiling and the machine learning has worked. So fake news cuts through the censorship. It is in fact amplified by the censorship because fake news increases user engagement. Fake news equals engagement. Engagement equals revenue. And thus was the feedback loop built. So Facebook is taking steps to demonetize fake news right now, but that doesn't stop the loop from doing what it does. It amplifies the things users want to see. It deprecates the things users don't want to see. And Facebook can make that unprofitable for the purveyors of fake news, but only to a point, because at some point, doing that decreases user engagement, and Facebook can't allow that. So Facebook is actually as trapped in this loop as its users are. Facebook has got its users deeply engaged by feeding those users exactly what they want to see. And if Facebook tries to change that, tries to represent things as they really are, user engagement is going to drop. Now, did you know that if I told you a heartwarming story of human compassion and giving that for the next little while, you'd be an easier touch, you'd be more giving. If instead I told you a story of untold riches and a battle to the top, for the next little while, you would be more miserly. Did you know that if you take a room full of math students who happen to be women, and have them read a scientific paper which shows why women aren't as good at maths and then test them, they underperform. We like to think of ourselves as very stable and very consistent and very fixed in our beliefs. We are anything but. And this is what we've learned about ourselves. We've learned how persuadable we are. And the trick of it lies in using the lightest touch. That's always been very hard to do, or at least it was hard before we built a surveillance and learning engine that carefully monitors and manipulates our moods. And that engine, Facebook, that engine can now allow anyone to deliver just the right message at just the right moment for maximum effectiveness. And before you cry science fiction, remember that that's precisely what Facebook was caught out doing in May. They're already doing that. It's not science fiction. That's Facebook's business model. But that capacity isn't just being used to sell makeup to vulnerable teenagers. Oh, no. No, no, no. 
there are different actors here with different agendas. The most concerning of these is a company called Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica builds profiles of voters. Cambridge Analytica uses that profile information to send highly targeted advertising via Facebook to move a voter to a particular position. Pro-Brexit, pro-Trump, anti-marriage equality. They know exactly when a voter is most vulnerable. They know exactly how to deliver that vote. Did anyone expect Brexit? Did anyone expect Trump? When there are aims beyond pure profit, the weaponization of influence takes on an entirely different character. It's propaganda, but not propaganda as we've ever known it. It's propaganda as it will always be from here on. It's targeted to an audience of one, one who has been observed so constantly and known so completely. Now, unless you're deeply involved in tech, which is probably a fair number of people in this room, but unless you're deeply involved in tech, you probably didn't hear that yesterday Google announced a whizzy new technology for Android called AR Core. It's AR for augmented reality. What is augmented reality? Well, it's the world that we live in curated. <laughs> the camera on your smartphone captures the world in front of it. The software inside your smartphone curates that view. The screen of your smartphone shows you a world that's been augmented. It all sounds quite wonderful, and if you remember the Pokemon Go mania of last year, it really can be wonderful. Now, Facebook is obsessed with augmented reality. This year, at the F8 Developer Conference, Mark Zuckerberg spent the first 20 minutes of his keynote showing off the new augmented reality features that Facebook will be bringing to its billion mobile users this year. Facebook wants to rewrite the way we see the world. The same technology that's used to censor the newsfeed of its billions of users is going to be put to work censoring the world. The real world is not going to be a reflection of what is. It's going to be a reflection of what Facebook knows we want to see. And Facebook will be watching us every moment. They already are. They're watching how we respond to that rewriting, learning how to engage us even more. And as we engage, as we become accustomed to that sweet and comfortable view of the world, the world as it is becomes more and more and more unbearable. Why can't this world, with all of its ugliness, with all of its rough edges, all of its cruelty, why can't it be more like what we see in augmented reality? And we're already there because the news feed is already augmented reality. And within 18 months, when augmented reality is no longer an app on your phone, but when it's a pair of very stylish spectacles, as Mark Zuckerberg was touting at his conference. When augmented reality is simply the way we see the world all of the time, that will bring a close to the last days of reality and the dawn of the post-real era. Now this isn't really about Facebook. Facebook merely got there first. They weaponized influence as a business strategy but you can't unmake a bomb. Now that we have weaponized influence, we need to think carefully about how to live in a world where the world is listening to us, the world is learning from us, the world is responding in a way that seeks to lure us into ways of thinking and feeling that reflect the goals of others. And we need to think about the actions of actors who do not value our own agency who seek to subvert our ends to achieve theirs.
Now, that's always been true. For as long as we have been able to speak, we have been persuadable. But this weaponization of influence is of a new order. It's a technology appearing very suddenly, and one that has utterly overran Cuban capacity. And we need to think about this. We need to think about what this means. We need to think about how we can defend ourselves against it. Now, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, father of the web, is actually disappointed these days by how the web has been used toward ends that seek to close rather than open minds. He suggested that the solution lies in asserting control over our profile data. And his project SOLID, solid.mit.edu, it seeks to do that. Where a personal profile is exactly that. It's owned by the individual. It's used by their permission toward their ends. And it's a noble effort. I hope it succeeds. But none of that stops the world from observing you. None of that stops the world from learning from you. We know how to do that now. The temptation to use it to manipulate people will only grow, and the barrier to entry to being able to do this will only drop. It's going to become a pervasive feature of the world, whether or not we assert control of our profile data. Now, as I wrote the essay that appeared in this, this is, this is a sort of taste of the essay that's going to appear in the summer issue of Mianjin. As I was writing it, I talked about these ideas with people who work in technology. Now, some people were slightly surprised by my framing. No one was really surprised by my finding. We have known really for years that this is going on. We haven't wanted to admit it. We'd prefer not to look. We'd rather that we could curate away this awareness. And if we do nothing, that's exactly what's going to happen. Because these systems will complete their operation by censoring themselves from view, becoming invisible and thereby becoming untouchable. We haven't reached that point. But in these last days of reality, we're very close.